<laughs> right, well, don't tell Jeremy Clarkson, but this could be the transport of the future. The reason why it's around here, look, it runs on used vegetable cooking oil. Well, here in Totnes lives a poet called Matt Harvey, and he's been finding out how, as fossil fuels run out, local people have been facing up to that challenge with good humour. Will you please welcome onto the stage the one and only Matt Harvey. Thank you. We're being filmed tonight because I'm making a film about the transition town movement. Um, you know, because I was anticipating some kind of spontaneous woo and I kind of got it, but it was quite feeble, to be honest. So I'm just going just to go back a bit, just, just rewind. Um, I'm making a film for the BBC about the transition town movement. My transition journey begins here in Totnes, where so many journeys begin, and will take me to Stroud and to Brixton before returning me home, if not wiser, then at least better informed. I actually got the wrong impression to begin with. I thought that it was a new kind of twinning thing. So rather than Totnes twinned with Narnia, we were going to be <laughs> Totnes twinned with transition. <laughs> Newton Abbott. Newton Abbott could be twinned with despair. <laughs> uh, it could work, couldn't it? Dawlish. Dawlish could be twinned with regret. <laughs> Transition Town is a grassroots movement that's been spreading both nationally and globally in response to the twin anxieties of climate change, which we've all heard of, and peak oil, a new one on me. Again, I got the wrong end of the stick. I thought, to begin with, that the, the world's supplies of olive oil were running dangerously low. I thought, you know, it's the, it's the end of salad dressing as we know it. <laughs> To counteract my endearing ignorance, I went to see Rob Hopkins, who came up with the Transition Town idea, and Rob introduced me to the concept of resilience. Resilience is the idea of, of withstanding a shock from the outside, whether as a community, as a country, how do you withstand that shock from and that the outside? That shock is the withdrawal symptoms from our addiction from to our oil. Addiction to oil. Yeah. So in terms of food, for example, this is where we are now, here in Totnes. The two main car parks in the town over there were, until 1980, big market gardens that grew fruit, vegetables, flowers that were sold on shops on the high street. We had a system of food feet, not a system of food miles. He gave me lots of information in a short time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I entered into this state of what's known as post-petroleum stress disorder. <laughs> um, post-petroleum stress disorder is what you observe in people when they, when they first grasp the scale of the challenge of right. breaking that oil addiction is going right. to be. And so they have this, it's like the dark night of the soul where people go, really? Oh my God. And so yeah. people respond to it in all kinds of different ways. Some people respond very fearfully. Some people respond with a kind of survivalist kind of, well, we're going to buy ourselves a little place in the Pyrenees and keep goats kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Some people respond with a kind of, bring it on, fantastic, this will solve climate change, just like that kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Other people have a kind of, well, I always told you so. Basically, my understanding of peak oil is that this year, uh, we, will, we will each use nine barrels of crude oil per head over this year. By 2030, there will be one barrel per head. It's about moving from probabilities, well, what's the probability that this will happen, to possibilities. Mm. And when we do that, it's really energising and really, really exciting. And I think that's the momentum that drives people forward through this process. And it's one of the reasons why, it, why it's been spreading so quickly. I had a gig coming up in Stroud where, sure enough, they have an active transition town group. So while I was there, I went basket weaving. Hello, is Hello. I'm Matt. Oh, you're Matt. Yes, I'm Hello. Nice Hello. Hi. <laughs> I don't know if there's going to be a chance for me to really get a go, but I'd love to I, have a go at something that I can actually a use. Well, if there's something simple I can actually... I might be able to impress my five-year-olds with. Well, the fish they Daddy like made this. Where are all the bottom sticks? Daddy can make things. Um, He's I a good he's, daddy. Um, of course, I know basket weaving in itself can't change the world, but I'm really here to meet Molly Cato, a green economist. It's all part of the decline of the plastic bag. They will fade from memory. I wanted to ask what changes she anticipates in a post-peak oil world and to check whether this whole transition thing isn't throwing the baby of progress out with the bathwater of excess. I think... You know, basically what we've had is 200 years of a huge beano from 
cheap energy. Mm -hmm. And we've got an enormous amount of knowledge that's come out of that. And really what we're going to have going forward is the knowledge without the oil. So I don't see we're going to have to manage without computers, but we're going to have computers where the components can be used again afterwards instead of everything being thrown away. Mm -hmm. And a large part of the economy will be actually mending things. So, right. no, it won't be going back. It'll be a new sort of future. But I think it's time we learned something from cultures elsewhere and in the past who weren't as wasteful as we are. I made, I made two very sweet um, willow... Well, they, they're, kind of, they're, they're Christmas decorations, they're little Christmas trees, but they, they're also out of season. They're like little coasters. <laughs> and in a post-peak oil world... Weapons. No. <laughs> and, uh, you know, unless this could also be shown to work in the kind of inner cities, and what was going to happen is that we in Stroud and Totnes, post Beacon, were all going to be growing our vegetables and sharing them and weaving baskets and carrying our vegetables in the baskets and making cob houses and having this kind of wonderful pastoral, bucolic, idyllic time. And then rough people <laughs> from the cities were going to come and just take them away from us. <laughs> So I went to Brixton, which wasn't so rough, where Transition Town Brixton has some 1,200 people signed up, where Lambeth Town Council are keen to get on board, and where local kids respond to allotments on their territory by saying, can I help? Let me, let me help, let me do things. Don't we look like I'm doing things, that's the key thing. <laughs> Without any actual... Um, I just lean on a spade. Building vegetable beds is very satisfying, even when your contribution is largely symbolic. Local resident Matthew Barrett is full of enthusiasm, but he wants to see more people digging. Most people like the idea of growing, but they don't have the time in which to do it, especially if they're uh, um, involved in just making ends meet. Um, it's like, how do we get the ordinary, everyday people getting involved? Until yeah. that happens, it's not going to happen. Matthew's got a point. Nevertheless, it's clear that seeds sown in Totnes have spread to Brixton, sprouted and put down roots. And of course, for everything there's less of, like oil, there'll be more of something else, like time. More bikes, fewer cars, less haze, more stars. More time, less stress, fewer miles, more fresh vegetables. <laughs> more stillness, less inertia. Less illness, more echinacea. <laughs> Less stress-related cardiovascular and pulmonary failure. More nurturing quality time in the company of a favourite clematis or dahlia. <laughs> more believed to be beautiful, known to be useful things. Less cheap, pointless, petroleum-steeped stuff. So yes, less is more, and enough's enough. Thank you. See you later. My visit to Brixton convinced me the transition town movement is capturing the imagination of ordinary people in different places and transforming anxiety about what's probable into enthusiasm about what's possible. One day, all this will be allotments and will grow food for all these people. Possibly. This year sees the 200th anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin.